a masterful Indian violinist, composer and conductor, seamlessly blending the rich traditions of Carnatic and Western classical music. This morning, we have with us on the next guest from the 973 show, the one and only Dr. L. Subramaniam. Namaskar. Welcome to the show. Namaste. Thank you very much. It's indeed an honor to be pleased uh, to be seated with you. Very kind uh, of you to say uh, that. Uh, it's, I mean it. And it's not every day like you get a chance to sit with a person like you. Thank, Thank you. you for taking your time to be with us. I would want to begin this talk with that from that intro of mine. What inspired you in this beautiful blend of combinations, the classical, the, the Carnatic and the Western? Because looking at the array of symphonies that you've created and the musicians that you've collaborated with, both from both the worlds. What is the inspiration? The initial uh, major inspiration was my father. He was my guru, teacher, guide, mentor, everything. So I wanted to, the original concept was my father's dream was to bring the Indian Carnatic violin to the global stage as a mm. solo instrument. Violin was mainly an accompanying instrument mm. during that time. They played with a vocalist, flute player or vena player. Once in a blue moon, even the most known violinist played solos. He said that sir, in order to become solos, we have to create new techniques, which are solo techniques. Mm. People who were doing great were having accompaniment technique. So he segregated to the said, if you want to go in the accompaniment, this is enough. If you want to go as a soloist, that's not enough. You have to create a lot more new technique because in the West, they have been handling the violin for centuries. Mm -hmm. And technically, they were far, far, far ahead of us at that time. So he worked a lot on creating a lot of new techniques to bring the Carnatic violin to the global stage. He said, like, go and listen to Ekudu Menuhin or major orchestras, New York Philharmonic, Chicago Symphony, or any major orchestra and see where they are playing, how they are playing, how we can bring our music to that level. So it started like that. So I worked a lot on the technique, everything. That attracted some of the Western artists like uh, Lord Menuhin and Grappelli and some of the great jazz artists, some of the conductors. So slowly they started, why don't you do something with us? One of such instances was celebrating 40th year of India's independence in 1987. They wanted me to play Indian violin. They wanted Lord Menion to play Western violin. Then he said, why not we play something together? It was his uh, suggestion because I think you can't go and ask much senior artists, I want to write some piece, you play with me. So he said, uh, then later on I realized he had made a lot of very great comments about me, uh, hearing, I don't know where he heard me. So I was invited to play for his 70th birthday in Bonn. Mm -hmm. After that, this uh, we played together. Subsequently, we started doing recordings. Orchestral things started happening. People started saying, why don't you write a piece for us exclusively and perform? So those, once you got committed to that, then it also, my father said, by doing all those things, by this collaboration, you are bringing Indian violin to, to a major, major mm. global stage. So don't say no, because I almost said no to a couple of major projects, mm -hmm. including Peter Brook's Mahabharata. I was uh, a musical advisor to that. Yeah. He had a nine hours of Mahabharata, which, you know, it was a sensational thing. I'm talking about 80s mm. in theater. People have to sit and watch nine hours with two breaks, whole Mahabharata. Okay. Uh, the, the projects like that in a film like Salam Bombay and things mm -hmm. like that, I got pulled into it. Uh, then my father's uh, thing, especially when Maestro Mehta came after my mother passed away, said, I want to do a piece, uh, your composition. You write a piece. I already had a composition before. He said, no, no, I want to premiere a world premiere and play it four times. You write a piece. That was the time my metal frame work was totally mm -hmm. out of music. Because my mother passed yeah. away. I don't want to do anything in the press room. All those time, you know, my father said, you know, to do this, uh, do this, because it will, because you, you were dreaming about, you know, meeting these people, mm. listening to Philharmonic Orchestra, meeting, many of meeting, but these are the people coming to you and asking me to collaborate mm. with you. Mm. So on your own, 
it won't happen but this is happening so this will also bring our indian violin carnatic violin to the global stage which it did it was his vision his guidance so i'm very very happy to say there's all the major concert hall we are playing in the classical violin carnatic mm. music played our ragas played our thing which didn't happen before my time he was the root cause but i get all the credit because physically i did it but all the thoughts process foresight who will imagine you know saying that it being an accompanying instrument we have to transform that to global solo mm. instrument and bring it to that level create everything that was his thought brilliant um so you are talking about taking the instrument to a global stage and we have symphonies orchestras all to your credits uh, my thought goes like this violin is known for its very uh, mostly pathos and you know it's you get drenched into a violin concert but do, have you seen audience as a challenge because you know to enjoy a violin concert for example tomorrow you're performing at the bar in kerala samajam on that note this episode will be telecast after the uh, performance you would be performing to a mixed audience to a mixed audience how do you find do you find that as a challenge that y- your audience not getting into that mood or only a select one uh, bit would be are you getting my concern Yeah, have I you have, found that because you've performed worldwide i have uh, whenever i go to a stage perf- to perform i normally i don't plan and okay. decide what to play the atmosphere there and ultimately there's in a voice hmm. which guides me okay so i just start playing an ala why do i play an ala 5 minutes at some place and why do i play an ala 45 minutes same all up somewhere else okay there is in a guidance there right. is in a voice so you feel the essence and also once you the first note you start playing the notes and vibration and the tonality of music takes over that guides you you don't play you just something happens so you expand from that music that the whole emotion of the tone spiritual we you cannot segregate music from spirituality mm-hmm. and culture and our roots so the music takes you to that road so once you are it's like going to a temple and sitting and meditating you think like you forget when you start playing the when the music takes over you forget whether you know you have to pay your telephone bill you have to do this you have to pay your insurance and nothing you forget everything similarly for the audience too mm-hmm. if that audience also uh, getting to the same vibration what is music it's just a vibration mm. that vibration which you hear transform to certain emotions and if you can bring life to each note and emotion to each note even an uninitiated audience who has never heard he will be impacted mm-hmm. because every human being is affected by emotion whether happiness or sadness or anything in between we say in our classical system there are navarasa i feel there are 10 rasas okay because one rasa which they don't talk about don't know the bhakti rasa mm-hmm. but most of the greatest classical composer whether it is tyagaraja or shama sastri or swaditrna dikshitar they all wrote composition in praise of some god or goddesses who they mm-hmm. believed in with that strong emotional connect mm-hmm. brought some of the fantastic composition so that is totally bhakti rasa which is totally surrender and praying or asking or saying your expression to the thing so that kind of rasa concept even for a totally uninitiated that's how you know sometimes you even something you see you get very emotional something you listen even without knowing if you close your eyes and the vibration does something to you so the inner voice guides you for me I don't decide so sometimes depends on whether I play 5 minutes or 15 minutes of an ala ala depends on the inner voice. Right. And I think you will get that chemistry right in the beginning right when you start yeah, the, the oh, audience. The audience yeah, okay. Uh your compositions uh, is there anything particular that drives you into into a certain composition what inspires you is it travel or do you pick things from around you because your compositions vary from style and in everything it's it's yes. a mix it's a rich mix what inspires you or what 
usually strikes you? You know, when we talk about composition, depending if you are doing a classical composition, mm. sometime you know, I've written a lot of Indian classical traditional composition, Krithis, mm. and some Varnams because there are no Panjannada Varnam written by anybody. There are multiple Varnams written by a lot of people. Specifically for the students, I wrote Panjannada Varnam, which is in all the five Nada. When we say Nada. is like subdividing each beat into number of pulses mm-hmm. you can have between two beats four notes mm. or five notes or six seven nine different mm. so according to that if it is three is a tisra four chatusra five mm. kanda seven misra nine sangirna so the, i wrote a composition panjanada varna so different different composition which is not there i want to explore and make it available so that it is all there not done when it comes to a uh, film music for example there you you have to enhance the character of the mm-hmm. film and the emotion in the background so suppose a particular character is a villain character or a particular character is a victim character you suitably try to compose the composition mood, yeah. melodies mm-hmm. which enhance the character even without um, looking at the character before speaks that emotion you have to try to do it when it comes to other composition fusion composition i have written a piece called uh, winter in austria i was once there uh, during in vienna for a classical concert it's completely you know beautiful and snow and everything so some in a melody you hear some sounds it transport you get some impression so that becomes a melody when i wrote for fantasy on vedic chants it was written for my mother because that was the time my mother passed away my sumeta asked me to write a piece initially i was not sure whether i can do it ultimately my father said why don't you do it and dedicate it to your father so i wrote a piece and zubi named it fantasy on vedic chant piece because at that time the ceremonial things happen the yeah, priest comes yeah. 13 mm. days and mm. chants uh, mantras and all those things so a lot of things were vedic chants were also i was hearing so the whole piece was based on fantasy or vedic chants the piece i wrote after my father died called beyond it is a concept of uh, body and soul that i met some of the saintly people at that time so they told me you know there is a body and soul there's no death to soul hmm. body perishes but soul leaves and it can enter on the body so it continues there's no So it's not that your father is gone forever. He's somewhere in a maybe better place and things like that. He's supposed to be there. So I wrote a piece which the orchestra was like a concept of body. The violin solos were in and out with the microtone thing as a soul. So different concept triggers something. Sometimes you go to a, a beautiful place. Some some unusual thing impresses you. You kind of transport uh, translate that into a melodic uh, structure which you. see and coordinate and write a piece so there are different kinds of composition mm. falls into different categories right does it make any yes, sense yes it did and uh, i think you have come to bahrain before many yes, times yes. Uh, i think you you are yet to see bahrain right yeah, perhaps this seen, time yeah, uh, this time i'm hoping yeah so when you see bahrain do you think you will be able to compose something for I'm this hoping, nation i'm hoping that's that's one of the reason i want to see for two reasons one is uh, if something unusual and if i can write a special piece I also am working on a book a uh, long time back one of the Italian uh, the museum director told me why don't you she saw some of my photographs she said why don't you have gone all over the world and uh, I've traveled more than 60s countries or plus performed without you know this thing so why don't you take those pictures and we I'll create an exhibition then you put uh, your own music behind it so that travel through globe yeah. mm-hmm. musically and visually so the, i started the project but uh, i never finished the project so i think there's a reason for it because there's i can include bahrain probably yeah we are hoping yeah, because right. bahrain has some yes. merits to offer yes. especially to indians yeah, and you're here to perform at the bahrain kerala samajam and we are proud keralites uh, forming the lion share of the expat community here Uh, I know you have uh, Kerala very, roots. Very strong roots. Right. Do you speak Malayalam, sir? I can understand Malayalam because okay. you know I was born in Chennai. Okay. My mother is from Tripura. 
Tripunathara. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When I was uh, young, small, every summer, my mother, my whole family used to go there. They used to have a house which was given by the Kochin Maharaja. My grandfather was working for Kochin Maharaja. Mm. The next to Purnathara is in Tempo. Okay. There's a little house which was given to him. So we used to go there. I still remember, you know, in the Paranai, they used to keep all the bachanam, okay. all the sweets, everything my mother, grandmother used to make and keep it. We slowly go there and eat all those things every <laughs> summer. All those memories. We, then my father's side, my father's mother and father, I mean, my father's mother was from Alapi. But I never saw her because she died even much, much before I was born. Okay. But my grandfather from my mother's side, both of them had uh, uh, blessings of being with them till their end. Then finally they shifted to Chennai. So coming back to it, I was born there in Chennai. Then immediately, you know, my father got a very major job in Sri Lanka to teach music and be the head of the All India Radio, or this uh, Sri Lankan radio. We spent time in 1958. There was a major riots. They were trying to kill all the... There was a big massacre. A lot of Indians were killed. A lot of people have to run away. That time we came back to Chennai. Then I went, studied there and to went to school, PSI school, then to Lila College, then to Madras Medical College. As soon as I finished, I switched over to music and then did my master's and left uh, for USA for quite some time. Right. Um, as we come to the close, festivals like the Indo-Bahrain Dance and Music Festival, how do you look at the role of such festivals, especially in a changing world uh, when it comes to fine arts? You know, the the definitions are changing. There, there is a paradigm shift. Um, as uh, we all know, the attention span has gone down. The audience type is changing. And the younger generation, they love more of fusions and collaborations and fast moving pace. How do you look at this scenario and the importance of such festivals? I feel presentation of the festival is a challenging thing. One, organization. Second, getting the audience. Hmm. Because audience, nowadays what is happening is easily everything is available in YouTube. Yes. So instead of if uh, here it is not that far, but if you go to other city like Paris or Germany or someplace, they say, oh, I have to drive one hour to go to the concert hall park and pay for the parking or even say in New York anywhere. So the audience, oh, I can as well see it see if the concert the, is mm. being streamlined and that kind of, that kind of uh, thing has come. But sitting in a concert hall and listening directly and experience that emotion will never come by listening to a video or CD or something like that. If you're a true musician, you can appreciate just the sound looking at, not looking at anything, listen to the CD with the headphone. I've been doing a festival for the last 33 years, Lakshmanarana Global Music Festival. Mm-hmm. After my father passed away, one of the things, I almost stopped playing violin for a while. Then at that time, Viji, she said, why do you want to stop? Because when your mother died, father asked you to do the uh, symphony with New York Philharmonic and everything. So that the music continues and I dedicated that piece to my mother. He said, why don't we start a festival in its honor? It, it is an extremely difficult thing because what we started, fortunately at that time, remember Subhalakshmi lit the lamp, sang the prayer song. Some of the great artists of that time, Bismillah Khan, uh, you know, all, the Subhalakshmi, all those people who were part of it and everything. Then it expanded, it, we started doing it in different parts of the world, different countries. And coordinating the artists, coordinating the audience, getting the audience, these are all very, very challenging. Now this year we had the about 80-piece orchestra and choir from Kazakhstan performing in multiple cities. And a lot of logistics, a lot of challenges. Unless the, uh, the per- person who is really passionate about culture and music, they will do it for two, three years and then they'll back away and give that headache to somebody else. But it is very, very important to continue the festival. Two reasons. One, what are we leaving for our next generation, mm-hmm. our grandchildren and children? Because if we stop it, because it is not suitable for us, that generation has completely lose the connect and roots of our own culture, which is very, very, very important. We cannot dissociate ourselves from our roots and our culture, whatever it is. Otherwise, we lose our identity. It is like losing your own parents, not knowing who your parents are. It is as much 
It's very important to know your parents, also to know your culture. So these kind of festivals connect the this generation to the future generations. Because somebody comes, listen to the concert, they bring their children, so the children get interested. Who knows? Yeah. What some of the grandchildren or children might become one of the legends of this uh, music or dance, or whatever it is. It is very important. But the audience point, what is happening is before in 60s, 70s and all those things, there are record companies where they backed, they selected certain artists who they thought will be successful. It was a purely commercial thing mm -hmm. record company did. I wouldn't say that they tried to do, it's a questionable, they say we promoted art. They saw, they signed the artists who brought maximum revenue back. So some of the artists we were signed, so they used to make LPs, promote, you go to a store, thousands of LPs. So out of that, some people pick these LPs, a number of sales, so the LPs, depending on that, they came back, pushed us to do more and more LPs and things like that. That has disappeared now. Now the lifespan is people listen to five seconds, 30 seconds and maximum one minute. That focus and concern before that, they get distracted, 200 things are coming. But we, that cannot be an excuse not to promote our classical mm -hmm. art. Because it is very, very important to think about the future generation, our own children, our own grandchildren. Festivals are important, but also it is responsibility of the artist to impress the audience, who are, even if they come for half an hour and sit there, to make them come back to the music. It is the responsibility of the artist also. Festival organizers, they have to continue doing it. And the artists have to think in the term. It's not that, you know, I just come and play whatever happens and go. It is important I make them feel special and they have something happens to them. So they come back to that music, come back to the art form and bring their next generation. Very well said, sir. Thank you very much for taking your time to join us. Special. We look forward to your concert tomorrow. Can I have your final remarks or a message to your audience who would be waiting for your concert? I am looking forward to performing tomorrow because I came quite some time back, a uh, few times. And those days also, you know, I used to just come for a day, play, and next day I was playing some other cities or at Russia and everything. This time I prepared and come one day earlier. So I'm very happy that I could do things. And, and one day later I'll leave. So hopefully I'll see some of the important spots. Thanks for, I got some information about the tree, live tree and the bridge and things like that. I'm hoping to see that and hope to come back. And I hope the audience come with no expectation. Listen to the sound and listen to the frequencies. Listen to the emotion of the music. And I hope you like the music. Thank you very much. Thanks. Namaste. That was the violin Chakrabarti, or the emperor of the fiddle, one with an eternal quest for music. India's pride, Dr. L. Subramaniam, with us on the next guest. So wait for the next exciting, engaging and interesting guest. <laughs>